what I always wanted to do. I always wanted to fire him. And to God be the glory. Great things he has done. He gave us his only son. Allison Weimeller. Most people know me by Doc. And of course, everybody, where'd you get your nickname? Well, my brother was three years old when I was born, and he wanted to know where I came from, and my parents told him, well, the doctor brought me. And as far as I know, I've been Doc ever since. My name is Jean Ann Cooper Weimeller, and I'm married to Franklin Allison Weimiller. And we have six children, and 19 grandchildren, and 26 great-grandchildren. I'm the oldest of four. And my brother was David Reed Cooper, who passed away 10 years ago. And then Carolyn Marie Cooper Thompson, and uh, Susan D. Clark. I was born and raised right in the house that we lived in. And of course, it was during the Depression, 1934. So most people, we were very fortunate. My grandparents had indoor plumbing. We had a bathtub and electric lights, where most of the farms didn't at that time. Even though we lived in town, but basically we were farmers. My dad and grandpa and my uncle Walt, the three of them, had three farms. The one close right on the edge of town was only 40 acres because my grandpa retired at one time when he was in his 60s and he, he owned the farm where divers live now. But he kept 40 acres close to town so he'd have something to do. Well, by having something to do, we all kids grew up having a cow to milk and chickens to feed and pigs to feed. One of my fond <laughs> fondest memories of New Albion was I got to go along with them when I was about eight, ten years old. We chased the fat cattle, chased them into New Albion, right down Main Street, New Albion, to the stockyards, and then the next morning we would load him on the train and go to Chicago. The little town of New Albany at that time was the biggest. They sent more uh, carloads of cattle to Chicago than any other town in the Iowa. If you sent cattle to Chicago, you got the, the free ride and the train home. And my dad would hire a cab and we'd go to Wrigley Field. And I've been a Cub fan ever since. <laughs> I guess that's the only vacation I would call that we ever had growing up. Of course, it was during the war. The World War uh, II. And everything was rationed, you know, the, Gas was rationed, tires, you could buy tires for your car. Everybody had what they call victory gardens where we raised all the food we could to help send to the soldiers that were overseas. And luckily my dad was 46 years old at the time, so he didn't get drafted. But most every younger guys were all gone. There, there were, weren't hardly any young people around. The other thing I, I really I like to tell the story about is when, how we learned to swim. There was a Winnebago Creek, actually it was in Minnesota, New Albans right on the border. It was deep, it had a hole, and uh, we, we, we never, there was a bridge where the 
passenger train went over, and uh, we, nobody ever wore suits. We, we had mud for suits if the passenger train was going by. And that's how the kids all learned to swim. There were no swim pools. Or, but then, of course, there was no, we had an old radio, but you had to get your ear right down close to it to even hear it. So we never, we never listened to the radio or watched it. Of course, there was no TVs, but we were spent most of our time outside. We even played basketball outside in the winter. We shoveled the snow, and it was it was a different world. I grew up in Lansing, Iowa, and my childhood was. Uh, on the road a lot because my father worked construction. It was during the Depression, no jobs in the area. And then he worked for a Kiwit Construction Company and Eyeshide Construction Company in Iowa. And so we traveled a lot uh, all through grade school. And then when I was in sixth grade, we moved to Idaho. And uh, my father worked to help build the Anderson Ranch Dam and we lived on the South Fork of the Boise River in the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, built by the government. We had a cabin, rows of cabins, and we lived on Rattlesnake Avenue. We had a common bathhouse. The cabin had uh, electricity, but no water, so we had to go out and pump our water. And we got to do dishes every night, and we'd fight over who was gonna wash and who was gonna dry, my brother and I. And we lived there three years until I graduated from eighth grade. And then my father asked if I wanted to go home to Lansing, Iowa to go to high school. So I continued my high school years in, in Lansing, Iowa. But when we were home, we spent a lot of time on the uh, Stiber farm. My mother was Muriel Adeline Coop, Stiber Cooper. And we spent summers and a lot of time there and Sunday dinners where she'd go out and kill the chicken and fry the chicken and, and uh, it's a wonderful meal. A couple of other things I, I remember about growing up. Uh, my brother was three years older, Di Louie, and uh, we slept together. I caught every childhood disease, the mumps, the measles. My brother never, never missed a day of school in 12 years. He never missed a day all the, all the while he went to school. The only bad thing about three, being three years older is he got drafted into the Korean War early and ended up uh, spending two years in the foxhole, basically, or underground in Korea. Never wanted to tell about it. But luckily, I, I didn't, my folks didn't want me there at the same time, so. When he got home, then I put my name at the top and, and uh, still con considered a Korean War veteran, but never really had to go there, so. We met in uh, New Albert, Iowa, Dreamland Ballroom. I went with Jim McGrew and, what year? 1951. <laughs> 1951. And um, he cut in. At the dance. At the <laughs> dance. And that was kind of history. And then he likes to tell the story. Yeah, we. that was December 7th, the first, first time I, date. I took her home. And uh, December 21st, I gave her a ring. And December 27th, we got married. But it was three years. <laughs> I like to make people believe we did it all in three weeks. But <laughs> So we were married in 1953, and I was 21 and he was 19. And I was a sophomore at Iowa State at the time. And she was teaching school in Nevada, Iowa, which was 10 miles away. So. And at Christmas time, we got married. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> well, from Iowa State, he, he went two years and graduated from that program, Farm Operation Program. And then he went into the Army. 
and we were camped at, he was stationed at Camp Chappie, Arkansas. And that's where, and I went also and stayed in town. The and, second eight weeks. Yeah. The second eight weeks. And then I had an apartment there. That's where our son Stephen was born in the Army barracks at uh, Camp Chappie. I got shipped out two days before I was born. He wanted to go to Europe. He got shipped out to San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and we were there yeah, two years. We spent two years there. And then uh, I went back to Iowa State. And I had the GI Bill then, so they helped me through school. In fact, the reason we got married the first time when I was in college, I was out of money. She had a job teaching, so. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but anyway, after that, it was mostly raising kids. Because uh, Ann was born while we were still in college. And then we moved back to New Albany and lived with my grandparents again. Well, my granddad had died while I was in the Army, but my grandmother was still in the house. So we lived in the house for, for two years. And I farmed with Louis. We bought the farm where our son David now lives, Louis and I, from my grandpa. Well, actually from my dad, because uh, when my grandpa passed away, my dad inherited that farm. And my uncle Walt, the other one. But uh, we we tried farming together. <laughs> well, we did all right, but my brother was not married and he lived with my folks, so any money he made, he wanted to put back in the farm where by the time, by that time, David was born, so we had four children. So any money I made, I had to support my family. So after two years, we decided this isn't working. So I made out a list. We had old used machinery, and I split it in two, and I told Louie, we're going to leave. But in the meantime, I got a call from a bank down in Lansing. And there was an old guy who wanted to talk to us. Well, his name was Jim Cass. And during the winter, I, I knew his farm was from, for sale. And I went and looked at it. It was covered with snow. But I'd learned soils that I was stayed and I I knew it was a good farm. So I went to talk to him. Well, this banker had called me. I, I talked to him earlier, and he wanted $80,000 for 340 acres, but he wanted cash. Well, I told him, I think your farm's worth $80,000, but I said, I don't have any cash. In fact, I still owe my dad $10,000 from going to school. And Anyway, three months later, I got this call from the banker in Lansing, who I didn't really know. But he said, there's an old guy who wants to talk to you. <laughs> and he said, uh, you're the only guy that ever told me my farm was worth $80,000. I'll sell it to you for sixty-five if you give me $15,000 down. Well, of course, I didn't have 15000 but I went to my brother and said, if you give me 15,000, the farm, the home farm's yours, and we'll just leave, which is what happened. It was, I, it was what I always wanted to do. I always wanted to farm. And then I guess from there, when we moved out here, I was all excited, but they had a, this Jim Cass, was a bachelor. There was this ridge where we live on was known for bachelors. The Cass brothers, the bachelors, were, uh, were <laughs> they were big supporters of the Catholic Church down here, St. Anne's, which is no longer there. And uh, 
they actually, we made the payments to the, they had given the, the farm to the church and we made the payments to the church. And that was the first farm. When we moved here, we had uh, four children and we had the four children in five years. And so my time was busy taking care of the children. And he told me that the house and the yard was mine and he took care of the farm. And that lasted for quite a while. The house was in disrepair. It did have lights and water and uh, a kitchen that they had added on. But upstairs, the, the plaster was falling off the walls and the, the wallpaper was hanging on, in the stairway going down and he said, don't touch that wallpaper. We don't have any money. <laughs> so it stayed that way a while until finally I did pull it all down. <laughs> well, <laughs> backing up a little bit, but Cass had a housekeeper and uh, they had a sale. I, I couldn't see what they were going to sell because there was no machinery or anything. They'd, he'd he was an older man. He had rented out the farm for 15 years. Actually, it was for sale, but everybody thought it was too high priced. It was a, it was the highest priced farm sold in Albuquerque County at the time. But we knew it was worth it because of the soil. Yeah. Anyway, what, when we came to the sale, which was mostly the housekeeper's old dresses and stuff, and and I could hear all the neighbors, because I did, we didn't know anybody up here. And uh, I could hear, I think he'll last two years. I don't even think he'll make it a year. And uh, I could hear him talking. <laughs> of course, most of them didn't even know who I was, so I was just in the crowd. But the <laughs> there was a lot to learn, because on the home farm where David's at, it, the water was artesian. It ran all the time. I knew nothing about a tank heater, you know, where you had to heat the water in the winter time. And uh, the cows, we never had a building for them, or up here. All the neighbors would put the cows in the barn at night. And mine were right out in the open field, because that's they were used to that. In fact, I learned afterwards that they had a lot of problems with, you know, with ventilation in these barns. They'd put the cattle in at night, and they'd get all heated up. And then they let them out in the daytime, and they had a lot more problems with the respiratory problems than, than I did. When we moved here, the water came off, the rainwater came off the roof and into the cistern, and that's what we drank until, um, that's what the Cassis had used all their life, I guess the water off of the roof, which he he said, I got a filter. Well, somebody had made, made a little square box about that tall. And just the water going through those rocks was his purification. It was supposed to be, in, anyway, in the spring it started, had an odor. So that's when we... Well, all the birds were up in the roof, pooping on the roof, but it was going. And he, he one of the main things is, whatever you do, don't change the water. I got my original teeth, he said. But we did. And, and we took about one drink of that. We were ready to, like she said, as soon as summer came, it warmed up. Why? We moved here the first of March in 1961. So then we didn't do any major remodeling in the house until 1971 and we had Iowa State University Extension home economist person come and help us drop the plans for a farm home where you, you look out the window there to the driveway and you have a big window here to see what's going on in the farm and a pass through for the... Well, this kitchen was the main thing that we did first. And I remember I joined the Farm Business Association and we had a real good Walt Pilgrim and he encouraged us against my better judgment. He says, do it now while your kids are growing up. Well, don't, they're home. don't wait till you can afford it. And so uh, we did. We, we had a five-year plan. Yeah. 
kitchen, the upstairs, the, we reversed the stairway. It used to go, uh, comes down the back, which makes sense that you come in the back door, you can go upstairs instead of coming through the kitchen. There was so much wasted space upstairs too, where you had to get up there and then turn. And it was, it was a good idea, but it, at the time, my finances were the big thing. And, but luckily, my my favorite uh, at Iowa State course was economics, and that that helped. That he went on to grad, we, uh, want, almost went to grad. He had 33 credits in econ. Graduating, thought about going to graduate school, and then, well, he said you were going to be a farmer, and we want to be a baseball player. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I grew up in New Haven, which of course was a baseball capital of, for a little town. So he wanted nine boys. But we, we had her as soon as Steve was, well, he was in kindergarten. He was the oldest when we moved here. And I had my own baseball team, little league team. Doc's little demons. We had a diamond out and back. We had enough room and, and uh, we, we, we even went down and played in Alvin, who was beating all the teams in lacrosse at the time. They'd all pile in his station wagon, and he'd pick them up half the time and take them home half the time all over the neighborhood. But growing up, I loved baseball. In fact, after we moved up here, I, Sundays I went back to New Alvin and played baseball for years. And This was my first baseball glove. I played third base, and I tried out with the St. Louis Cardinals one year when they had a tryout camp in lacrosse. First year, I did real good, or first day, I did real good. And the second day, they says, we'll call you, don't call us. I'm still waiting. <laughs> About. 70 years later, I'm waiting for him to call me. <laughs> but all our kids, uh, the first four, I should say, not the last two, the first four were up in that barn all the summer long, stacking bales. And, and uh, I was there too, and my dad was there up there too, Edwin Cooper. Yeah, he came to work for us when he retired from the construction. Construction. He, would, he would pick them up and load them on the um, elevator, and then we'd all pull them off and throw them where they're supposed to go. That made good girls basketball players. <laughs> they were tough. Speaking of basketball, I played granny basketball for 15 years, and uh, I finished, quit in 2019 because my doctor said I shouldn't play anymore. He, I said, well, can I play basketball? And he said, no, you can play foosball. No, that didn't work. Anyway, Granny Basketball was invented in Lansing, Iowa. We had our first game in 2005, and it was for a fundraiser for the Old Stone School that uh, my, my uh, basketball coach's daughter retired back to Lansing, Iowa, and she recruited me one Sunday in church and said, here, sign this, a clipboard. And I said, what is it? I was 70 years old. And she said, you're going to play basketball. I said, no, I'm not. Well, I did, and it turned out to be a lot of fun. Uh, we had, now there's teams all over the United States, and they have a tournament every year in Des Moines. We play the Senior Olympics. We join the Senior Olympics and play, have our tournament there in West Des Moines. And now the National uh, Granny Basketball Tournament is in Decorah, Iowa this year, next weekend, I believe. And my friend who uh, originated, started Granny Basketball, moved to California, and she's bringing a team from California. And uh, it was in Prairie Sheen a few years ago, the national tournament. She came and stayed here with me, and her name was Barb Tomlinson. But this basketball bug that started a long time ago, I can, I can remember when... I played in high school. When she played in high school, and when I first started going with her, my dad would say, oh, that's that tall one that always beat us in basketball. That Cooper girl. Yeah, that Cooper girl. They didn't like me. <laughs> well, he just, he'd smile when he said that. She's the one that always beat us. But, well, all our kids played basketball, so I don't know how many basketball games we've gone to in our lifetime. 
<laughs> it'd be fun to know, but anyway, that, that's been a part of our life all the time in basketball. The girls hold records up in the high school for a track, mainly for track. And Renee's high jump record was just broken this year from 1975. She jumped five foot three and a half. And somebody just beat that record this year. And then Anne was name is up there for uh, some rel relays. And Caroline. Well, I still have a record, no Alvin. Oh, for what? I had scored 38 points a game one time, man. I scored 36. In high school. <laughs> well, but that was, we had a gym in New Haven at the time in the basement of the school. It was a three-story brick building, but in the basement they had a gym and they had uh, heat pipes hanging from the ceiling in there. So you almost had to shoot a line drive <laughs> to make a basket back then. And Stephen held the hurdle record in Wakhan in 19, he graduated in 1972, I believe. And, but his was broken um, like a few, like that year already, a few, I don't know how many weeks later, a uh, month. Of course now, our younger uh, grandkids, great. football great. is the big sport now. And we didn't even have it when we were growing up. <laughs> Lansing going to well. But all of our boys played basketball and and football. And wrestled. <laughs> well, my grandpa was born, I think, in 1864. My dad was born in 18 or uh, 1895. But they were they were both born in the United States. But my great grandfather would have come from Germany. In the 1700s, would they have come over? I would guess. My grandfather, um, my dad's father, grandfather came from uh, Scotland, George Cooper, and Forfarshire, Scotland, and also his wife, Mary. And uh, my mother's parents. Were, lived, they didn't, weren't born in Germany, but her folks, uh, Dees, were born in Germany. And also the Stivers came from Germany. And uh, my grandmother was Selma D. Stiver, and grandpa was uh, Fred Stiver. And my great-grandparents, Henry and Magdalena, are buried up here in the little corner that my husband, he mows the lawn all the time and takes care of the cemetery for the church. The Stivers went to the church and the church was um, a mile, two miles up the road and it's there no longer. And the, it was uh, up at Ridge Church, I believe. And they spoke German and the men sat on one side and the women sat on the other side. And there was two communion glasses and one for the men, one for the women. And I have those two communion glasses now that my grandmother gave me for one of my birthdays and uh, they went to church there for years. And then the cemetery was down here because I believe there was no rocks down here where they could dig the graves easier. And it's now a um, pioneer cemetery or abandoned cemetery, so we can't be buried there. Well, the reason we know this, it, it was in the abstract for this farm that that church had bought a half acre off this farm. And of course, when we moved out here, it was in disrepair. <laughs> there was brush growing. And... A few years ago, we had people come and uh, monument people come and restore the stones. Well, it, the, half of them were tipped over, about half of the stones left. So we raised $3,000 to at least get the stones back up and put a base under them. And then I got interested in cleaning headstones. We both went to a, a meeting one day and learned how to do it. And I just kept on now cleaning uh, stones in cemeteries. I average almost 20 times a year that I mow it, so. And trim. But it's a, it's a donation. We went to the United Methodist Church 
um, and I have played um, piano organ in church ever since I was probably in ninth grade, off and on through the years, mostly all the time, except maybe when the babies came. And I'm still playing in church. Uh, there's two of us that play, so we ta all take turns playing. And uh, we bought a baby grand piano from my colleague, Phyllis Hyde, and that took a lot of talking, didn't it? And then she taught piano lessons. Oh, I so. gave piano lessons for many years also. So she was working, but she got to stay home mm -hmm. to do it. So. The children would come after school on the bus and walk in the driveway, and sometimes there'd be three in the family, and sometimes they'd be staying for supper. They'd be playing under the table, and they'd still be here, so we'd feed them. And <laughs> And we'd have recitals every every spring, and um, invite the parents to come in. Have the in later years we had the recital in our church. church has always been very important for us. Uh, that really bothers me now because when the kids were little, we always, Sunday we went to church and now it's getting to be where there's sports events, everything, especially Sunday mornings. And that used to be at least on Sunday. Well, in fact, when I grew up in New Albany, there was nothing open on Sunday, not even a gas station. If you ran out of gas, you had to hope somebody had some for their lawnmower. Or now, it's 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 really our country. I think is certain because of that. And uh, we always, of course, there was a ball game. It was snowing. If we could go to the ball game, we'd go. So that was. Other people would always use, well, we didn't go to church because it was snowing. I says, would you have gone to a ball game? Yeah, well, that was our, if you could go to a ball game, you could go to church on Sunday. And then we used to, I used to like to hear her mother tell the story. They lived in a farm a couple miles from here. And of course, that was before everybody had a car. And she said, we'd never miss church because we had to go out and hitch up the horses, get the sleigh ready, and uh, heat up some bricks, and put them underneath, and put a rug over them, put their feet on that. And she said, we never missed church. Can you think of that now? <laughs> All the excuses people have. If they were still in diapers, they didn't, kids, children did not get to go on vacation. They had to be out of diapers. So then we had to leave the babies home when we went. And we tried to take a vacation every year with the children. The first time we went, we had to borrow money. And I I just decided we were going to go. We were going to go out with them. We always wanted to go west. Nobody wanted to go where there was people. Everybody wanted to go. And uh, I remember going to the bank in New Alb and Old Earl Welch, and I was, I think I was shaken because I, I told him the truth. I said, I want to borrow $500. I want to go out on vacation. And I had no idea what he'd say because he was an old conservative. Everybody ought to have vacation. You sure that's enough? <laughs> and we did, we had a, a two door Ford, and we had three kids that were. If they were out of diapers, they could go. And uh, one of them would lay up at the back window, one of them on the seat, one of them on the floor of the back seat. Of course, there was no seat belts. And we had a water bottle hanging in the front of the car. And we went out. To, and the best stop was we were up in the Big Horn Mountains. And we saw a, kind of like a dude ranch. and. And they had a jeep. They took us up in the mountains in that jeep and 
had a flat tire, but they didn't have a jack. And, and I can remember this guy wasn't worried at all. He got a big rock and a, and a board or a stick. A stick or a limb off a tree. But okay, all your kids get on the other end. And we, we got the car, the Jeep up high enough so we could, and stuff like that, they never forgot. But we were very fortunate. We got to travel to Germany and uh, Amsterdam. Peru. Peru, the Marco Picchu, that, that's That was really amazing. And that floating island where they get, that these reeds grow up. And this whole island is nothing but reeds. And there's people living on it. We got to visit them. And, and my mom would always babysit when the children were younger, and they lived on the farm next down the road, like a half a mile down the road, and Dad worked for us for a long time. Anyway, we're very proud of all of our children and grandchildren and uh, great-grandchildren, and now the great-grandchildren, when they are learning about family history, they, they call me and the grandma, how are we related to George Washington? So I keep papers on the board, and our common ancestor is Lawrence Washington, and then George, and then on the other side, the Washington, then uh, Washington married a Reed, and my great-grandfather is a Reed, Joseph Reed, and his brother was Richard, who married to Washington. So we're like second cousins, George Washington, eight times, I don't know, removed a few times. <laughs> But it's history, it's written in the history book, and I don't remember exactly the name of the history book right now, but I do have it written down. My grandma, Caroline Reed Cooper, made sure that I knew all of that because with those papers, I could have joined the Daughters of the American Revolution and other organizations also. This is one of the first pictures we got of the farm. This was the first building we built. It's somewhere in the late 60s. Thing we built with a handicapped bathroom. And told the kids we didn't want to go no home. <laughs> They'd have to come take care of us. And there's the baby pictures of the six kids. Edwin Reed Cooper, my father. He worked for us for many years. He's um, grain and feed. And uh, his wife, Muriel Adline Stiber Cooper. And then her parents, Fred and Selma Stiber. And then graduation, husband Franklin Weimiller's graduation picture. David Weimiller and nephew Marine David Reed Cooper, Jr. Her granddaughter picked them out and their names are on the map. Okay, <clears throat> the first Weimiller, Frederick, Frederick Weimiller, who came from Germany. Our wedding picture, 19, December 27, 1953. A picture when I was teaching school, Jean Ann Cooper. And then our daughters, Anne Muriel, Val Victorian, and Jean Renee, salutatorian. And then pictures of children, Stephen J., Jean Renee, Anne Muriel, David Frank, James Todd, and Caroline Noel. This is Doc's mother, Miriam Isabel Tabbitt. His dad, Frank Weimiller. And then all the children, Renee, was holding, who was she holding? Jill? It's been so long ago. There's my sister Susan and my sister Lynn, and Chelsea, Michelle, um, Eric, and Chase, and Daniel. And there's a new baby, I don't remember. <laughs> This is at Caroline's wedding. Muriel Cooper, Jean Ann, my sisters, Susan Cooper and Lynn Thompson. And that, that's a picture of the Board of Trade where James worked. 
he worked in Chicago on the, in the, on the Board of Trade when he first got out of college and rode the, went to Elgin and caught the L. Okay. My quilt hanging on the wall was made by my grandmother Caroline Reed Cooper and my Aunt Virginia Cooper lens that given to me when I was a baby. Still there, still good. And then the girls drew pictures and this is kind of the toy room now. Um, over here we have pictures, uh, Renee and Anne, and when they're elementary, I framed them, put them up there. And the furniture is from Doc's home in New Alban. Doc and Louis slept in these beds in their room, bedroom. Um, we played we're, we played the Globe Trotters and uh, on the weekend, and then came home and uh, somebody called me the next morning and said, "Gene Ann," I said, "What? Do you know you're on the front page of the Des Moines Register?" I said, "No. Well, you better go buy one and look." So there it is shooting baskets in Des Moines at the big arena, playing the Globetrotters, and we all had our uh, programs initialed or signed by them, and it was a good time. These are some of the records of every year that we farmed. We belong to Farm Business Association, and so I can go back and tell you what the price of corn was ever since 1961 at least. <laughs> this is the first one that I shot that was worth mounting. And then I don't know how many years later, we, I shot that one just below Steve's house up here in the ridge. We weren't even in the big woods. <laughs> And that one measured, at the time, 21 inches between. Our grandchildren uh, gave us this for Christmas one year, and my mother had written this little note, and it's actually the little note is handwriting right over there on the desk. When we walk to the edge of all light we have and take that step into the unknown, we must believe one or two things will happen. There will be something for us to stand on or God will teach us to fly. Love you much, Mom. Muriel Stiver Cooper was a great lady, very kind, intelligent, and lived to be 99 and a half. built it. It was kind of multi-purpose. It was a cattle shed, but we also used it to store dried corn and, and uh, we had pigs in there. We got separate pins for the kids to have 4-H calves. My great-grandson just made that in shop class and walk on. Drew Sullivan Weinmiller. Everything has changed here. Our our grandson, Eric, and his wife, uh, Bridget, they live here. They raised two children here. Uh, Michelle. They're still being raised. Uh, and these hog barns, they built after I re retired. And of course, they remodeled the house at different times. But that one barn, red barn there, that was here. But this shop we built, this is kind of our headquarters where everything starts in the morning. And uh, this is where I got to pick up some mineral here to take the village, correct? This is the mineral I take to village, correct, every other day. This is where all the big decisions are made about what we're going to do next. I think these hog, uh, hog buildings hold about 1,500 hogs in each one. <laughs> this is the boss now. So. <laughs> The next place we're going is a newer version where 
Instead of two buildings, it's one, but they hold the same number of hogs. Steve. This is our son, Steve. You want to say hi? Sure. You on camera? <laughs> How are you? Uh -huh. Ready for breakfast? Yeah, these are replacement heifers that will get bred this summer and become part of the cow herd next year. Feeding them, hand feeding them every day, we try to quiet them down, and get used to you. Become mamas with a baby calf. Um, a lot easier to deal with new calves when the cow is quiet. It's amazing how the this cow's mother and this cow's grandmother are all really quiet cows, and it just carries over into their offspring. That some of them don't like to interact with humans much, but some of them are just like pets. We usually get somewhere in the 14, 15, 16 years of calves out of them. So they'll be around the farm for a while. Well, dad's been doing it since he got here in 1961. And this will be my 46th year in the operation. So, yep, he's still going strong. The, the cow herd, I think, is his favorite part of the farm. Um, I know he's going to take you on a tour today of the pasture farm with the cows and calves and he'll be taking mineral down. He keeps the salt mineral in front of him down there and I think they've really enjoyed the life on the farm. Dad will still runs the combine for us in the fall. So he, I know he'll be itching for the crop to get maturity and get ready for harvest late September, early October again. So I think it's all our favorite time of year on the farm is when the fall harvest comes around. After you've gone through the spring of putting the crop in and the cost of the inputs and watching it grow all summer and uh, finally reap the rewards. Always uh, hoping and praying for plenty of rain and uh, sunshine and a good harvest. Going down to the other hog barn. Yep. Flag. Yep. Okay. Good. Yep. Steve is in that process of retiring now too. He's 68. Eric is kind of the boss now. He's our grandson. 43. Probably. You can see. All our farms that are up here, except the pasture, the Sandville farm, the home farm, and that one over there is where Steve lives, our son. We did, as you can tell, most, most of our land is terraced. We were one of the first ones that did any terracing around here. But now, uh, now they, uh, They've changed some of the rules, plus, as you can see, it's all no-till. They don't, no plow, no disc, and nothing. With the newer corn planters, they can go right in. It makes a little furrow where they can plant the corn, and that's all that's worked up, so that you don't, if you use no-till, you don't even need terraces anymore because of the soil, there's no soil loss. things really changed, but when we built all those terraces, I don't know how many miles we had at first, but now they're, they don't do that anymore. They, they leave wider buffer strips and make hay off of it. And of course, the no-till is the biggest reason. These, these were 
both built after I got out, so <laughs> I don't, all I know is what I hear them say. And this is what we call the Olish Farm. And then after we bought it, we terraced it all. We cleared a lot of it that was just rocks and trees. And then we built that barn. And that was 1972. And then we built this Farrowin house in, uh, in about 10 years time, it became obsolete. I mean, the newer ones were, and anyway, when it became obsolete, we just abandoned it. So it's a, one of the newest buildings around and it just sits empty. And this was built as a hay shed for round bales. So now rather than using this as a hay storage, they use it mostly as a machine set. And this is where we, uh, I'll show you where, when we have the calves, we've always have them here at this farm. And then we take them down to the pasture. We'll get out for a minute. Here's where the, where the cow, if she's having trouble, we can keep them in different pens and bring them in. We can swing that out and, and get her calf, and the calf can suck or we can help without getting kicked. <laughs> this was pretty new to this. If you get a baby calf that it, it gets born out in the snow or something before we get it in, this is what you call a heater. You can bring them in here, put them in here, and there's heat underneath like a heater and leave them in here for a few hours till they kind of warm up. And then usually they, you'd swear some of them are dead when you put them in there. An hour later, they're get them out and they're sucking their mother. <laughs> Okay, we're standing in Thompson Corner Cemetery. My great-grandparents are buried here and other relatives. The church her grandparents went to used to be up the road a half mile. Columbus we, Ridge was the name of the church up there. It's real rocky there, and the only thing we can think of, it was too rocky to dig graves. So they came down here and bought a half acre off the gas farm and nobody was taking care of it. It was grown up in brush. And anyway, we, I decided, I, I didn't like looking at it. So we cleaned it up and I've been mowing it ever since. It took a family effort. It was like, should we or shouldn't we? And how much is it gonna cost? And then we got the money to do the monuments and it looks a lot nicer now. But her great grandparents are buried down the Stibers. Supposedly there's over a hundred graves here, but there's only about 30 stones because I thought I wanted to be buried here. And she went up and checked at the, at the courthouse and they said it's full. Well, <laughs> it's full, but I don't know if they had wooden crosses and they rotted away or what happened, but. They said it's a closed cemetery, Pioneer Cemetery. You can't be buried here now. Because but, there's graves, all people buried all over, and we don't know where they're where they're buried. Her her mother was a Stiber. That's Muriel. And my grandparents are the big stone over here, Henry J. and Lena, Magdalena. <laughs> and down there, where those smaller white ones are, there was nine graves in a row, all young children from one family. Which but they the must have got on the farm we're on. Diphtheria or some kind of disease. And they lived on our farm before the Casses, the Martins, the people whose children are buried there. But there's a lot of names here where there's nobody by that name left in the county. <laughs> well, 
well, we're what we call the Village Creek Farm. We're, uh, we're in Lafayette Township. And uh, this farm, there's about 700 acres here. The, I bought about 500 originally, and then Steve bought it, or when we were farming together, we bought another 200 up on the top of the hill. When the cows are down here, I come down here about every other day, check on them. At one time, this was a dairy farm. There was a big white barn here, and there was a house here when I bought it, but nobody lived in it. The biggest drawback is there's a lot of fencing, and most of the fencing is up and down the hill. So every spring, we have to walk the fences. <laughs> Anyway, that's still the biggest job is the fencing. Some people just feed their beef cows salt blocks. And when I was at Iowa State, they ran a test and how many licks a cow had to make to get enough salt off of a white salt block. So we've always fed this uh, mineral, and it's got uh, vitamins in it, and I really think it helps uh, keep in control of pink eye and some of the other diseases. Well, we're going to drive up. I don't know. I hope the cows or some of them are down here. They might all be up on top of the hill, but we'll drive up. It's two miles from one end to the other but I can drive the pickup most of the way, so. Well, this is what I, my little red book where I keep track of, of the date, the number of the cow, the date the calf was born, whether it was a heifer or a bull, and if there's anything uh, extra about it, like if we had a bullet. And um, Eric usually keeps one too, but now he's, with all the modern neck top technology, I think it'll all be in his cell phone from now on, but, but I'll keep my red book. But I, I got the little books back for, I don't know how many years. Let's get washed. Yeah, so I also have a big yellow sheet clipboard. I was gonna bring it and forgot it, where I transfer all this so in case she washes one of these or, or it gets lost. We got a record. But like I said, that Eric's going to have all that on his cell phone one of these days. <laughs> when we first fenced these 15 acres, there was no spring here. But that one year we had a lot of rain and it opened up another spring here. Yeah, this is the tree the last time we logged. They wanted to cut it in the worst way. Of course, it's down here at the level. But I, if it was up on top of the hill, I'd worry about lightning. But I, I said, I want to keep it because <laughs> I measure it every year. And I used to be able to get this around there, but I, anymore, I have a hard time doing it. <laughs> Eighty four inches around, and I don't know if it was eighty one or eighty two last year, but it's really it, it, they can tell by the bark and stuff whether it's high quality. And they figured it's veneer at least thirty feet up, so and I know I got a few more of that size up there, but one thing about it, I never, I figure it's a lot better growing that much every year than it is 
selling it and putting the money in the stock market because that went the other way. <laughs> well, the, the home farm down in New Albert has that big spring on it where David lives now. I never, I couldn't believe it when this farm came up for sale because that's the first thing I noticed was it had that big spring ran right through the middle of it. So the cows would always have fresh water. And, and then when I found out the price, I, I think I would have given him a lot more if he'd asked me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great pasture farm, a great hunting farm. And it just, when nothing else is going right at home, I used to like just come down there and uh, it was always peaceful. And I, I always liked cows, so <laughs> they were the only company I had. But And I still like, if I know it's the day I gotta go to Village Creek, it's just relaxing to <laughs> even think about it. But, and just about anybody that's been down here, I think feels the same way. <laughs> that's why it's real popular for the firemen who always have their rides, uh, Waterville and Lansing, they always ask if they can come through. And of course, I'd, I'm welcome to have them visit, but as far as trying to buy 10 acres from me, that's not gonna happen. I said, that one, for one thing, the grandkids and kids would shoot me if I started selling off 10 acres <laughs> to ruin it, so. And like I say, it, the timber was just a bonus, I just, wanted to pasture farm and I never thought it would happen. <laughs> really get a kick out of it. Sure, <laughs> a lot of difference in the grandkids. Some of them aren't afraid at all. And the next one is <laughs> the opposite. But after they get the pet core, they're, <laughs> they're not afraid anymore. <laughs>
vaccinate the calves and we're putting stuff in the back of the cows and get some fly protection for how oh, doc how many how many days is that fly supposed to work? Probably a few weeks. Oh, she's got an air tag. <laughs> we used to brand them all. And now lately we've just been putting a tag in each year with their number. And then when the calf is born, we uh, 504. Put a, put a, 504. Tag in the calf's ear corresponds with the cow. 504. 507. If you live long enough, you get an easy job like this. This, at the end of the year, this is the permanent record book. So I can go in here and look up the cow, what date she had a calf, and what it was a bull after. And then I grade them in the fall, one through five, like this one here, at a five every year. So. If she has a heifer, it's a good one to keep. 901 heifer. When we first started in the cow calf business, we, we couldn't afford a veterinary, so I cut them all myself. Because we didn't have all these vaccines back then. We did have a black leg and a couple other ones, but. Some of these uh, vaccines, only a veterinary can use them. So that's one, one reason. got the cap from the heifer. Yeah. I'm gonna run over and spray that one and I'll get her number. Okay.
like I said earlier, the best uh, crop we raised was six kids. <laughs> and they're all God-fearing kids. And to God be the glory. Great yeah. things he has done. He gave us his only son. Bye. Bye. Can we meet again? We love you. Bye. Bye.